This is episode 102 of the Equestrian Author Spotlight podcast. I'm Carly Cade, and today, Rebecca Didier of Trafalgar Square Books returns to the show. Rebecca works for Trafalgar Square Books, the leading publisher of equestrian books and videos. She currently serves as both managing editor and graphic designer, and her role in the small company spans acquisitions, editorial, design, and marketing. She has worked with top writers, trainers, and equine experts from around the globe to bring their books to print. Rebecca has designed more than 200 book covers for the nonfiction, biography, memoir, and fiction genres, as well as packaging for videos. She is co-author of the book Dressage with Mind, Body, and Soul with world-renowned animal behaviorist Linda Tellington-Jones. Rebecca writes and rides whenever she can, splitting her time between Boston and Vermont and metal ponies and the real ones. Saddle up for details about the first annual Buy a Horse Book Day, brought to you by Trafalgar Square Books and Heels Down Media. In this interview, you'll learn how you can participate, as well as take advantage of deals, sales, and prizes on Buy a Horse Book Day. Now, let's get into the interview. Welcome to the Equestrian Author Spotlight Podcast a podcast featuring interviews with equestrian authors who love all things horses and writing about them. In each episode, you'll hear inspirational stories from horse book authors, including writing advice and marketing tips to help you write your very own horse book. If you're an author, aspire to be an author, or simply love horse books, then you are in the right place. I'm your host, Carly Cade, and creative writing makes my spurs jingle. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Equestrian Author Spotlight Podcast. I'm Carly Cade, and today I'm very excited to welcome Rebecca Didier of Trafalgar Square Books back to the show. We have some interesting things to talk about with her, uh, including the up-and-coming Buy a Horse Book Day campaign. So hi, Rebecca. Welcome back. Hi, Carly. It's so good to be here, and thanks for bringing me back to talk about this because um, we're excited to make it an annual event, hopefully. Yes, I'm so excited to support this and we needed a day like this. So this is a really, really exciting thing that we're going to be talking about. But I did want to ask before we jump into Buy a Horse Book Day, since we last talked, I mean, you're honestly one of my favorite interviews. You shared so much information on the behind the scenes of the publishing industry with us. I would like to know, have you had any more exciting horsey adventures since we last talked? I think I saw something about uh, Ocala in one of your... Instagram posts? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we're, you know, I'm pretty lucky that I get an annual trip to Florida uh, for work every, usually every February or March. Um, my colleague, uh, the managing director, Martha Cook, and I go to Florida. We have a lot of authors who are based there. Uh, if not through the whole year, they're there for part of the year and usually that part of the season. Uh, no one can blame them if they're from the Northeast or Northwest because mm-hmm. it's awfully nice to be in Florida <laughs> that time of year. Usually it spans kind of Wellington. Uh, New Smyrna and Ocala. And this year we really focused on being in Ocala for longer because we wanted to spend some time at the World Equestrian Center. Have you been there yet? Oh my gosh. Yes. I, I was there in March. My aunt lives in Ocala and I, and she took me there first thing and we toured the facilities. Actually, they were doing Grand Prix jumping while we were there in the evening. And it, it is an amazing facility. <laughs> it's wild. It's wild. I mean, we, we have some vendors on, on site who we wanted to talk to in person. They're carrying our books. They're hosting book signings on a regular basis, which is awesome. And then we also had a, an author who had a special author event the, the weekend that we were there um, on the grounds. But we got a, you know, a really great tour around. We popped our heads in the barns. We, you know, went through the hotel and ate at the Yellow Pony and did the whole thing. <laughs> but I mean, the number of people who were there who had nothing to do with horses and are just there as kind of equestrian tourists, uh, it's its fabulous what it's going to do, I think, for bringing in just the general public into, into the horse world. I was really impressed. Very impressive. It's, it has like a very chic feel to, to it yeah. too. Everything's really classy and the artwork is great. And it's like the perfect place for, for a horse lover. And I, I love hearing that they're supporting author signings and you have vendors on site that are selling the books. That's, yeah. that's what it's all about. That's so special. Yeah. Perfect and place think- for it. I think all of that is very, it's very much in its infancy. Obviously, they're still bringing in vendors and trying to figure out what their educational component is going to be. There's a lot of potential there because they have so much space to work with. Mm -hmm. Uh, So we're excited to see, you know, where this goes and what kind of ends up happening. Uh, In the meantime, I, I, 
I think it's kind of Disney World for horse people. You go, and it's beautiful, and you have lots of entertainment and things to eat, and you know, it's just it's 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 beyond impressive. So I encourage anybody who's in the area to at least go check it out. Yep, and that's the perfect way to sum it up: Disney World for horse people. <laughs> <laughs> that is exactly how I felt about it. I was like, wow. I mean, yeah. <laughs> huge and there's horses everywhere and people everywhere and yep. the the it's the yellow pony right yellow that was, pony, yeah. yeah that was really fun we ate there they have little bar stools that you can sit on that are that look like horses or or saddle racks <laughs> yeah it's really yeah. awesome now you've been on the show before and I'll make sure to link to your previous interview with with the show notes for this one but would you refresh listeners or maybe new listeners about Trafalgar Square books, the in the type of horse books that that you publish, and kind of the work that you do there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, Trafalgar Square Books is the leading publisher of equestrian books and videos. More so, our focus is on books. Uh, we've been publishing books for over thirty five years uh, for the good of the horse. That's our kind of guiding principle. Uh, no matter what it is, whether it's fiction or nonfiction or how to or a memoir. Uh, we really want it to reflect the connection that we can have with these animals and uh, and proper and fair care and training of them. Um, our our first book that we ever published was in 1985, and it was Centered Riding by Sally Swift, which remarkably most people know about. Uh, <laughs> it's sold, a, you know, almost a million copies all around the world. So it's a very well-known book. And that set the bar very high for us. Uh, we went on from there to really focus on publishing practical how-to books. How to ride better, how to train better, how to take better care of your horse. And now, uh, mostly in the last, I would say, three years, we've branched out, done more biography and memoir, have quite a few of those to offer. And I'm really excited. We are doing a middle grade novel that will be out in the fall this year, which is a terrific book. So I'm really excited about that. So we're still kind of expanding our list and really growing. I'm the managing editor there and um, the lead graphic designer been doing it for 20 years, which is crazy. So, but it's a really small company. So you name it, I probably have a role in it in some way, shape or form, but my focus is guiding the books from acquisition to actually being on bookstore shelves. And that is amazing. And I, I encourage anyone to check out Trafalgar Square's catalog. Amazing, amazing horse books. In fact, I have centered writing on my bookshelf. Uh, when I was when I was younger, my mom bought it for me, and it was you know it's up there with my horse books. So well done, and you keep going and expanding and growing, and I'm I'm so excited for your success. We're here today to talk about something really exciting. I cannot wait for this. You've partnered up with uh, Heels Down, which is a equestrian media company, to create Buy a Horse Book Day on May 10th. And this is going to be an annual event. Can you tell us about Buy a Horse Book Day? Yeah, so um, I have to give a lot of credit to Heels Down and Patricia De Silva, who owns it. We partner with them. We're, we uh, run ads and work with them on a regular basis and do various projects with them. And so in one of our regular meetings where we were all generating ideas and brainstorming, Patricia said, you know, Montreal does this amazing buy a book day and it's a huge success. And I've been thinking we should have a buy a horse book day mm -hmm. and should we work on this together? And Martha and I were like, Oh, wow. Yes. Why haven't we thought about this before? Um, just, you know, these days with how busy our lives are, how busy social media is uh, we often find that we need a kind of impetus. We need just an idea of how to make a day remarkable or make an, a difference in somebody else's day. Like today, for example, April 30th is independent bookstore day. So mm. anybody, you know, on April 30th, every year you go out, you visit your independent bookstore and you buy a book and you show support. So now this will hopefully be something that happens every year. Um, we want to pick May 10th to just be the steady every year. It'll be the same day. And that's a day when you just, with you know, very intentionally, you go either to a tack shop or a bookstore or online to your favorite author's, you know, online bookstore and you buy a horse book that you've been meaning to buy. And that's not just to feed your own soul because you wanted to read the book anyway, but it's to show support for those authors who are, you know, out there being creative and writing stories and giving, sharing their expertise and their know-how. And you're also supporting the publishers who support them. And if you bought it at a small a small shop, then you're supporting that small business too. So we see it as like a win, 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 win all the way down the line. And if this isn't about us or our company or our horse books or our authors, 
we want to spread the idea that all of us could work on this together and promote the fact that reading is a good thing. Education is a good thing. We should all continue learning about horses and how to be better partners for them and, you know, sharing our know-how and our, our, our services with each other. It, I mean, that would just help us all and grow us all. So that's the goal. <laughs> I love this. And I, and I appreciate how inclusive you are with this campaign and, and inviting everyone to participate because this is for everybody. You know, it's like, let's all get together and rally around Buy a Horse Book Day and make this a big deal. And, and you're sharing the graphics and you're inviting other authors to participate. On Buy a Horse Book Day, uh, you'll be offering deals, sales, and prizes uh, to help get people excited to participate. What kind of cool things are going to be in the mix or is it a, a mystery, a secret? <laughs> no, not totally. I mean, there are still, there's potential for any number of things to actually occur on the day of, but the, our main things will be that we have um, a number of authors who are in touch with Heels Down who will be featured in some way on their end of this, on, uh, of this whole effort. And I know that we've made sure to share that information with all the other authors we've been in touch with that Heels Down is inviting anyone who has written a horse book or is involved in publishing to be on their podcast, their Heels Down Happy Hour podcast, and to be featured in their newsletter, which I think is just tops. So that's one component. We, on the day of, we will be having 20% off site-wide sale plus free shipping, try to just encourage people. And we're also having our authors, um, encouraging them if they sell on their own sites, which some of them do, that they also offer some sort of special deal. Um, anyone who buys a book from us on May 10th, like directly from horseriderbooks.com, which is our online book book site, book site, bookstore, they will be automatically entered to win a shopping spree. Ooh. Uh, so, you know, you buy a book, you might end up being able to spend a hundred bucks coming back and picking out all the other ones you want. And we'll also be randomly watching, not randomly, very intentionally scanning and watching for people to tag buy a horse book day or to tag us or heels down media over the course of the day. And then we're going to give away free books. Mm -hmm. Heels down is going to give away um, a couple gift certificates. So there's just going to be stuff kind of popping out. You never know if you're going to win something, but I mean, hopefully the idea is that everybody's going to end up a winner because it's going to be fun. We want people to post pictures of themselves with the book they just bought, even if it's just them, you know, pressing buy now online. Oh, it, it could be a picture of your horse book collection and the one that you're adding to it. It could be a flea market find. I mean, all of it counts. And I think we're just trying to really tap into that love and passion that people have for, for books in general, but for horse books specifically. Oh, this is so exciting. It makes, it makes my heart flutter and my, <laughs> my, I get butterflies in my, my belly thinking about all the people that are going to be sharing their love of horse books, you know, so this is so exciting. Now, the, one of the most important parts of this campaign, so you can, you can get in the mix and, and Trafalgar Square can see and Heels Down can see your posts is to tag, what's the hashtag? Buy a horse book day. So the hashtag is buy a horse book day and then also yep. make sure you tag, which I'll put in the show notes, like how to yep. participate, but make sure you tag Trafalgar Square Books, which is horse and rider horse books. Rider books. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then heels down is, is the other, is it heels down spark? I think it's heels that you can tag both heels down spark or heels down media. Got it. So okay. both of those qualify. Yep. Yeah. So make sure we tag. So we show yeah. up and we create this, maybe we can trend. Yes. You can trend on Instagram. Imagine, Twitter, imagine right? how exciting that would be. Take, if you see it happen, take a screenshot. Oh yes, I'm going to be keeping an eye on this. I, I want to flood the universe with information about horse books on, yeah. on May 10th. I love this. Talk to, talk to us about how your authors are going to be participating in the day, but then, you know, the sales obviously, mm -hmm. but other things that they might be doing. And then talk about how, uh, you know, independent authors like, like myself can participate also in the, in the campaign. So for our authors, um, we have a lot of professional horse people. Um, they're really busy and a lot of them either don't do their own social media or do it, you know, at the very barest of minimum. They don't necessarily have graphic skills or things like at the ready. So we're providing graphics to them to announce their participation, um, which is the first step. So we've done like an initial one, just let people know that this is coming, it's happening. And a lot of them have already posted and shared in their newsletters and on their um, Instagram and their Facebook accounts and on Twitter. So that's terrific. And then we'll share again, some pre-made graphics for the day before and the day of that again, those authors can use and let people know, hey, you know, go buy a book wherever it is that you're, that you're going today. And it, it can be, you know, at 
Target. They have horse books there too. And, or you can come to my website if I sell them, if, if you imagine that I'm an author and you can buy from me direct. So we're encouraging them to do whatever they feel comfortable, but mostly, mostly just impress upon people this is happening participate and tag. In terms of other horse book authors and writers, uh, you know, we've just, we've been sharing the same graphics. People are welcome to use them. I also want people to feel free to create their own as long as it indicates that buy a horse book day is what it's called and that's what you should tag then you're being part of it so if people want to brand it a specific way if they want it to relate more to their own the books that they have published I, I want people to feel free like this isn't about one person getting credit or one company getting credit <clears throat> or about one you know set of authors somehow um, you know getting more out of it than another this is really just about all of us having fun together right mm -hmm. so if you write a horse if you've written a horse book even if it was 30 years ago, go ahead, share, say, buy a horse book day is coming up on May 10th. And I encourage you all to go out and buy one or maybe buy mine because it's still available at Aid Books or, you know, it could really, the sky's the limit in my estimation. And I'm really hoping that, I mean, you and I have definitely have a network of people who are independent publishers and, and prolific writers. And I, I think they should benefit from this, this event every year as much as I hope our authors do. Oh, that is so generous of you and, and, and just opening the doors wide up and asking people to participate. And I, I love how you said that this is a day for us to celebrate writing books, horse books, our readers, and just get the word out and have fun. I just, I love that. That is like such a cool way to come into a campaign like this. So, you know, thank you for starting this and let's take it and really put it out there, everyone. So that is fantastic. So when it came to developing the campaign, I mean, you, you were in partnership with Heels Down Media. Were there any challenges in, in kind of trying to put this campaign together? Well, I think uh, the fact that Patricia put it out there to us and we all reacted with a, you know, kind of, duh, why, why <laughs> have we not thought of doing this before? Awesome idea, Patricia. Let's make it happen. And then the immediate positive response we've had. I mean, we've had emails from people I've never spoken with just from putting out a newsletter to the FPR, to the AHP group. We were, I was in personal touch with individuals who I have some sort of personal relationship with, uh, but even all our authors, everybody's like, oh yeah, great, I'll do this. I'll, I'll let people know. So that's been the easy and the very rewarding part. Now, the challenge is realizing, and you've already kind of indicated this yourself, there's so much potential here, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I know that I could be doing a whole heck of a lot more each day in building out this promotion and finding ways to reach more people. We haven't, in, like we work with distributors in Australia, New Zealand, and the UK and Europe. I haven't even like rolled it out to them, but this could become like a worldwide event easily. Ha, you know, it's about time. The big challenge here is time because really my, my real job is making sure that I'm still publishing the books that we can then celebrate and they get kind of put on pause when we get really involved in something like this. And on the day of, I'll really be, you know, deep into the social media and trying really hard to track and see what's happening and engaging with everybody who's, who's playing and having fun and doing this. So I wish I had more time or I had a dedicated team who was just really, I think, because I think it could be bigger and maybe this could be the launch point. We'll see how it all flies. And then we'll be able to kind of surmount those challenges next year and be better prepared to, to grow it. Yeah. I hear what you're saying. I mean, that that's part of being a small business and, and, you know, a small team is that you always wish that you could have more hands to make things bigger. But I think, I think it's the best part is that this is going to be an annual thing. So I think you're totally right. You know, launch it this year, see who participates and how it takes off. I can see it going worldwide. And then every year there could be a, a new different sort of angle or component to the Bio Horse Book Day. You know, this year it's share share pictures of your purchase. Next year it could be the same, but do this, you know, do the wear this shirt, have this button on, you mm -hmm. know, like we could do it it could be so cool and every year have a little bit different angle. So that's very exciting. So you are now officially on the committee next year. Here's I'd be my, happy to. <laughs> <laughs> Here's my show and tell. We did we did a short run number of bookmarks that say buy a horse book day that we put we sent out to all of our well not all of our authors but authors who are on the road or clinicking or who, who had events coming up where they could be handing them out with this idea that you know there's something in, in hard form that 
could be handed out, try to generate interest. But I absolutely agree with you. I mean, perhaps next year, individuals who have participated this year would want to form kind of a group work. Mm -hmm. And we all find ways that we can have some merch because I could see people wanting the merch. We can develop it into something that's more than just sharing pictures, as you say. Um, Maybe there could be themes. So the potential is there. Yeah. And then, you know, and I, I love that you're using your authors in different areas and, and they're kind of like your street team, right? And sending yes. them materials to pass out. That's <laughs> awesome. Every, every author could go out and do, or get a group of authors together and do like a book signing on horse book yes. day. I, you know, I can see, I can just see so much possibility. So yes, count me in. I'm happy to, to be a part of your, your, your group to help it grow, grow, grow. That's yeah. what I'm all about. So I really wanted to talk to you about this. I mean, it's probably going to be hard for you to pick, but I've, I've interviewed a lot of your authors and you have an awesome herd and everyone is so nice. And I, I really like the work that, that you're publishing and the books these people are writing. Uh, is, do you have anything new and upcoming uh, that you really want to talk about in your catalog or anything that's come out recently? So in terms of upcoming, I'm actually really excited about our list because it's, um, I just feel like it's a more diverse list than we've had in a long time. I don't know if you're familiar with working equitation. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's kind of a, it's a really growing sport. It started in Europe, but we're really seeing there's now um, an association based in the U.S. and we're really seeing it grow. And we have um, a California-based author named Ali Kermin who did like a really basic foundation how to learn and practice the obstacles in working equitation. And it's just a terrific book. It's, I mean, it's a how-to book, but it's terrific. And so that's incoming. Of course, everything is really slow right now. I mean, this book was finished months ago, but it takes months and months and months for us to actually get them in stock because of all the shipping shipping and production issues. So we're dealing with that. And then we have a a new book from Mark Rashid, who's a favorite storyteller Mm -hmm. of many. Uh, We have a a really wonderful memoir from Texas horseman Van Hargis, which is also coming um, later this summer. Uh, I mentioned earlier that we have this terrific middle grade um, novel, which will be our first fiction in a long time. Uh, It's by a woman named Melanie Sue Bowles. And the the protagonist in the story is just totally my hero. She is, she's a fabulous, fabulous character. And I hope we see more of her after this first book. So this is, this is a really fun project for me because of course, fiction is kind of where, where my heart is. So all of those books are kind of in the, in the, in the production line. And um, we have a huge new book from, I don't know if you're familiar with Sharon Wilsey. She did our horse beak and horses in translation. And she loves those books. <laughs> She's become an international hit because of, I mean, she's from Vermont and she, nobody really knew about her when uh, she, we published her first book, but now she travels regularly to the Netherlands and to Germany and she's big in Japan, kind of like a band, you know, when you're big in Japan. (laughs) Um, And her new book is The Essential Horse Speak, Continuing the Conversation. And it is, it's, it, it was a massive undertaking for her and for us. And it's terrific. It's just the most complete book on understanding horse body language and using your own body to talk back. I can't say enough about in terms of, I think it's value. It's huge because it doesn't tell you to change how you train horses or how you ride horses. You can do that however you want. This is just something you can incorporate Mm -hmm. into what you do to make everybody feel better. Your horse understands you better. And I mean, it's really changed how I how I introduce myself to a horse, a very basic thing, right? Funny, the the little things that I grew up with horses, I know you did, and and you never, it never occurred to me that I should ask my horse's permission in an overt way. Of course, mm-hmm. I would never like force myself on a horse who obviously was afraid, mm-hmm. but most horses, I just, you know, I know horses, I know how to be around them. I'm very confident. I'll just go up and I'll say hello. And Sharon's work taught me to kind of ask them permission. Yes. Not, not just force myself into their space, assuming that they're okay with it. And so it, it's, that was an interesting transition for me as a lifelong horse person. Well, I, I don't know everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the more you learn and the more, you know, the more you realize you don't know anything. Hopefully. There's always more, more to learn. Yes. I always ask permission now with, uh, with fly spray when I'm walking yeah. up, like I'll be, I'll wait and I'll be, is, is this okay? And then, I, and then I go in it's it. Yeah. It's fascinating book. Uh, I'll link to, to that book in the show notes as well. And then did you want to mention this book, which I am in love with? A man walks into the into a barn. <laughs> yeah. So I am a multi 
I'm a multi-book reader at all times. And um, so it's not just about books that I'm working on, but also books that I have around the house that are stacked in piles that I'm reading on different subjects. Like all the piles behind you, you're, you're behind yeah. you on your desk. She has piles up to, up to like the back of her, of her head. That looks like my nightstand. Yeah. <laughs> some, some of those are books I've, I've worked on and some of them are books I still have to read. So <laughs> the TBR pile is out of control in this house. So Chad Oldfather's book, A Man Walks Into a Barn, it just came out and it's just, it's such a terrific book. It resonates specifically with me because I'm a parent of a hockey mad child. He's mm. a very serious hockey player. And so we devote a lot of our time and our energy supporting his love for that sport and trying to help him get as good at that sport as he possibly can. And you find yourself as a parent measuring what it is, you know, because dreams are dreams and some of them are really far-fetched, but you want to support your child and whatever those dreams might be. And how do you do that? in a fair and balanced way while looking at everything else in your life, right? Mm -hmm. And Chad's book is basically about that. Um, He is a, he teaches constitutional law at Marquette University and he had three little girls who got bit by the horse bug and he shepherded them um, through very early riding through the different levels of being very, pretty highly competitive, mostly in hunter jumper circles, but also some dressage later on with one of his daughters. And it's about, being the horse show dad, the dad at watching his children ride at a ring for hours upon hours and hours, driving them hours and hours and hours through the mm-hmm. Midwest to get to de- different destinations and show venues. And th- the value in that, that in the end, it isn't about whatever the, the initial goal might have been, you know, ride for the U.S. equestrian team or whatever it is that is what sets a little girl's imagination on fire or a little boy or a little child, whomever you are it's not about that. It's about that process. And Mm. he really, I think does a wonderful job about creating parallels as a father of young people immersed in a sport really, and a passion mostly, Mm -hmm. and how you can do that in a balanced and sensible way. um, But without holding them back, which he certainly didn't, he gave them every opportunity. He, I just, I love that book. (laughs) <laughs> I, I I loved it too. I, I read it in a day. A man walks into a barn and uh, stay tuned because Chad Oldfather will be on the show. Uh, I'm doing an interview with him shortly. So that's an episode coming out and we can learn, great. we can dive deep in, and he'll tell you a lot more about the book, but yes, great read, highly recommend. So good. <laughs> so you wear a lot of hats. You, you shepherd books all the way through you know, meeting the author or the pitch all the way through the end and trying to get it through the pipeline, which is all stuck right now and trying to get these books out into the world. How do you, how do you keep learning? Like, how do you keep, uh, keep yourself like with a, with an extra little edge? Well, I think you probably experienced this as well. Um, being in publishing, at whatever, whatever form it might take, it's fluid. So I I don't have a choice. I have to learn. I've been in it now for 20 years and I do things much differently now than I did when I first started, when I edited everything on hard copy, which I rarely do anymore. I also uh, work in my, I work with design software that changes some almost monthly, which I complain about all the time, (laughs) but I'm also very aware that it's good for me because I have to, I'm very, I'm pretty much self-taught. So I have to then muscle my way through relearning certain systems and teaching myself how to use the different technology that we're confronted with at all times. Being passionate about what it is that we create. So the fact that I, I love books, first of all, I love the way they smell, the way they feel, the way they look. I love horses. And so I really love horse books and you put them together and, and it's just amazing. So that being ultimately what I'm creating and something that I feel is doing a little bit of good in the world, not any and nothing bad, helps me feel the impetus to continue to absorb what it is that I need to learn to continue to be good at. And and as you know, trends change, fashions change, what it is we're interested changes, our audiences change. How do we stay in touch with them? How do we continue to create things that resonate with them? And then how do we share that with our authors who might have a very distinct idea of what it is that they want to create? And then we have to help them sell it. So we have to find that place that it meets, right? So we don't have a choice. I have to keep, I have to keep learning. Um, And and that's okay because ultimately, I think my niece, I have a niece who said to me once, when's the last time you did something for the first time? Mm. 
And at the time I came up with some answer that wasn't too pitiful, but the phrase, really, the question really stuck with me because I, I think it's really important that I'm always trying to look for one new thing to add to my repertoire, whether that's related to work or um, the hobbies that I have, or you know, go out and try windsurfing for the first time. I'm not too old, you know. <laughs> keeping ourselves up for those sorts of little gambles, it, it, it's important so we don't grow old and stale. We become old and interesting instead. <laughs> I like that. Let's become old and interesting, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's Eleanor Roosevelt who said, do one thing every day that scares you, right? Like, yeah. and we'll, we'll shift that. Do one thing every every day you haven't done before. I, I really like yeah. that. And obviously you're very passionate about your work and, and passionate about books, passionate about horses. So the learning, I think when you're very passionate about what you're doing is, is easier just to absorb and be like, I'm doing this because I want to do the best job I can. So I think that's, that was really lovely. Thank you for sharing that. Now, is, is there anything that you wish you had known before you got into book publishing? Is, is there anything that surprised you once, once you got into the, into that work? Oh, I wish I had known that it, it, if I published books, then I wouldn't write them. <laughs> That's, I mean, I have, I have co-written books um, and I'm currently working on another one within one of our authors, but it just, it takes, it takes so much of you, at least in the kind of publishing that I do, that it's all in there and there's nothing, there's, there's just nothing really left. I mean, you said it yourself, you, and you need to recharge, you need to have introverted time in order to create. Mm -hmm. And so I need that introverted time just to kind of resummon the energy needed to help create the books that I already create. That doesn't mean the ideas and the desire goes away because it's still there and alive. You know, if I could have it both ways, I would, but I think it really will be later in my life or just, um, I think I have five more years, my son is 13, so five more years of really active parenting. And then once mm. he's maybe out in college and what have you, I'll have more time to, to really push my writing along. It's not, it's not that I don't love what I do, but I definitely don't have the, the time or the energy to write the way I want to. Mm -hmm. And I, I, since since we've met, I, I know that that is a passion that you have that you that you have your own novels and ideas that you that you want to do. And that, that was actually one of the questions I was going to ask you if there'd been any developments there. But what I what I know is that all of this experience that you're gleaning in in this realm in this portion of your life, as well as parenting and and being very involved with with hockey and all the things that you need to do to support your son, I truly believe that that all of this is leading you to that place where you write the very best book that you've always, always, always wanted to write, you know, <laughs> it's, it's got to it, yeah, <laughs> be leading you there. I, you know, everything kind of sets you up to get to that place because right. I know it's not going to go away. And I know you've got that book in you. And then all of a sudden it's going to be like, I'm just doing it. And yeah. then all these things are preparing you. I mean, you know, maybe something that happens tomorrow will wind up in that book, you know what I mean? So I know you'll do it. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate that vote of confidence. And I do think, you know, it'll be interesting to see as my life changes in the next few years, as my son grows up and as priorities shift a little bit, whether I, I actually can set myself up to mm -hmm. take advantage of that. Um, since I've always, I won't have that excuse anymore. You know, <laughs> oh, I don't have the time, you know, once I have the time, I've really got to push myself and make it happen. So you can, you can, uh, you can keep an eye on me and check in and say, Hey, Hey, it looks like you have more time. <laughs> <laughs> Did you put your, but my, the biggest thing is just putting your buns in the seat. I swear. It's like, every time I sit down to write, I'm like, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't want to, I don't want to. And then after I do it, then it's like, Oh, I actually feel good about myself. Yeah. You know, it's like, that's the hardest part is just sitting down and starting to do the work yeah. um, always. So Yes, I will. I will come after you and I will check in with you and I will give you lots of words of support and say, did you do your writing this morning or this evening? <laughs> you can count on me, Rebecca, I promise. Thank you. <laughs> of course, if you weren't, well, I think you answered this. If you weren't in this profession or field, you would be a full-time author. Would that be, or is there something else that you would love to try and do? Also, my, my family, I've joked with my family, every time we go to a state or a national park and camp, I always say, I really want to be a park ranger. <laughs> and so there's this little piece of me that still thinks that, you know, living in a beautiful place and helping introduce people to that beautiful place and, you know, also being a little bit of an authority figure, that would be a pretty fun job for me. And maybe I could combine the two and be a park ranger who also writes books, because I think park rangers probably have a lot of quiet, lonely time. Mm. You know? <laughs> 
So yeah. <laughs> I love that. I love that. That would be a wonderful job. And you get to wear a cool uniform. Right. <laughs> and then you can be the park ranger with, with a horse, a side gig writing books and the uniform. So you can have, you can have it all in that thing. scenario. <laughs> the whole thing. And every, to every place that we've gone different places around the country and you know, you're in these absolute beautific places and there's the, the park ranger in the cool uniform. Mm-hmm. It's just like, yeah, you wake up every day and mostly what you do is tell people where to go. And then you stamp little kids, little passports when they're doing a good job and going around parks. And I don't know. It's a, it's a fantasy that I indulge in. <laughs> I like it. I like it. I think that's, that's probably the most interesting thing I've heard someone say that they would like to do uh, if they weren't doing what they were currently doing. I like that a lot. <laughs> yeah. Is, is there anything uh, outside of horses that you've read or listened to lately that's really inspired you? Well, in reference to that TBR pile, I've got a lot going right now. The two that are in my active rotation, uh, I've been carrying around Amanda Gorman's uh, collection of poetry, those mm. those things we carry, I think it's called. Uh, I, I admire her so much. I think she's such a true talent. And uh, I can read a, just a couple of the poems and think, now I'm ready to go out and, and make the most of this day because of what she taps into. And then total divergent choice, but um, I'm reading a, a, an autobiography um, called Off Mic, which is about this guy named Doc Emmerich, who's a, an NHL announcer. And I happen to crush on him in a major way because when he calls a hockey game, he it's like poetry. I mean, he does these things. Well, he no longer he's retired, but I used to watch games with my son and be so fascinated by the words that he chooses to describe hockey, you know, and how one phrase flows into the next and then he drops in a little statistic about something. It's it's a true and amazing talent to be able to call something that's so quick. And this book details how he decided when he was like a freshman in high school that he was going to be an NHL announcer one day. And then talk about picking a really far-fetched dream. And he made it happen through, you know, a whole bunch of hard work and being willing to be poor and do a lot for a little for a very long time. So I tend to really like stories like that, that teach you that hard work sometimes does get rewarded. Um, Mm -hmm. I like those kinds of stories. So, yeah. Yeah. I love, I love those kinds of stories too. That's, that is amazing. I love that you're reading books about hockey, which is something that your, your son is really interested in that, that you've then, you know, brought into the fold for yourself, you know? So it's like, that's, that's amazing. Books teach us so much, you know, it's like, uh, when I, I got a job in the energy industry a million years ago, and it was, I was working with, um, electric vehicles before they were even popular. Like the first Teslas weren't even out yet. And I was working with a company that did electric vehicle charging networks. And I, knew nothing about the energy industry. I came from the music industry and went into the energy industry. So I bought like every book I possibly could on electric cars. I bought a, you know, and, and I bought books about the energy industry and I just sat down and I read them all. And my husband looks at me, he's like, you give yourself a PhD in whatever you're interested in by all the books that you buy and read. <laughs> no, but it's true. I mean, it's the best way to educate yourself. You can just jump into a book and, and learn. It, it makes you a very interesting dinner partner. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> if you know a little bit about a, l- a lot of different things and you can, you can do that. I always said that that's why I really liked Dick Francis um, mm. as a writer and his mysteries were always so interesting because you walked away knowing like a little bit about cigars or a little <laughs> bit about scotch and, and they were well-researched. So it was fact-based information, even though it was in fiction, but then you could kind of drop that knowledge in a discussion about something else. He just didn't have to say, I learned it from a Dick Francis thriller. <laughs> it's like, I just know about scotch. <laughs> yeah, no, that's the, that is the best thing about books. Seriously. Yeah. And like, you know, some people think that you don't learn anything from, from fiction. They're like, I only read nonfiction, but it, that is so not true. Like there, yeah. every book you read, there's a, there's a glimmer of some inter- interesting, something that yeah. you can take to another part of your life. That's, that's why books are so cool. So everybody read. <laughs> I wanted to ask, ask this too. Would you share with us three people who have been really influential to you in your life and in, in chasing your dreams? So this is an interesting question. I don't think I've ever been at, I've never been asked this question. <laughs> and so it really makes me think a little bit about, we have such a parade, right? Of individuals yes. who come and go. And of course, I'm a, I'm a real believer that even if you just smile casually at a person on the street, you somehow influence them because um, mm-hmm. maybe that person had a horrible day, but then got a random smile and changed things. So the whole butterfly effect is totally my deal. 
So when I was in seventh grade, I had a teacher named Mr. Minnie. It's a memorable name. This is probably why I can remember him. And he had like a mustache and was kind of partially balding. And he was my English teacher. And uh, I had him for one year. And he probably had such a profound effect on me because he thought that I had a, I was really naturally gifted as a writer. Mm. And I, I think before then I had always done it, but nobody had ever told me that there was something there that was an ability or something that I should, I should grow and nurture. And Mr. Minnie made it a very, very, a very pointed effort to encourage me to write. And um, it, from that moment on, it became part of everything that I did. I ended up majoring it in college. And so even though he was only in my life for a short period of time, that, that's a huge influence right there. And then my in high school, um, I, I was a pretty serious basketball player and I had a coach um, all four years. His name was uh, George Gabriel. And uh, he believed that I was good enough to go D1. And so he spent a lot of time pushing me, yelling at me, um, <laughs> holding me to really high standards. He drove me to camps and practices. Sometimes he paid for camps for me because my parents couldn't afford it. He taught me what it means to really be disciplined and to also to be able to aspire to things that maybe you wouldn't have come up with yourself, but that someone else really believes in. And I ended up First of all, I was a very good girl in high school, mostly because of his influence. So we'll take that as <laughs> a, a, a good influence. And then I went on to college and I played basketball. And part of the reason that I went to the school that I went to was because of basketball. So this was a person who, again, my life tracked a certain way because of, I have friends who got married to people I met in college and maybe they wouldn't have met those people if I hadn't had George Gabriel pushing me to play basketball and do a certain thing. So he was, he was huge. And I really haven't thought about him in a long time. So it's kind of <laughs> nice to, to, rem to remember that somebody was that impactful. And then for a third person, I would say that I, I mentioned her a lot and you know her, you've met her. I would say Martha Cook. Mm. Um, she's my, my colleague at, at Trafalgar Square Books. Um, I've known her now for 20 years and we've become really good friends over that time because we, we travel together for pleasure and for work all the time. We spend a lot of time together. We know when to not talk. <laughs> I know when she needs a snack. <laughs> she knows when I need a glass of wine. I mean, but um, you know, you get to that point, I think because we live, we work in a really, a really hectic, crazy, stressful environment. We support each other. I, I admire what she's done. She's very self-taught in the business um, end of things. I really admire what she's done. And it's gotten to that point now where I, I look to her for advice all the time. She, she's like a big sister. 20 years is a long time to have somebody figure that largely in your life. I have lots of friends, but I'm not with them as much as I am with Martha. <laughs> so she's definitely a huge influence. Yeah, Martha Martha is amazing. And, and yeah. what you're doing, what you guys are doing together. I love that there's friendship there too, alongside the work and, and you've been together for so long and support each other. That's special to know when someone's hangry is a very important yeah. skill. <laughs> It absolutely it can save can save both of you. Oh, for sure, hundred <laughs> percent. I'm still trying to train my husband on the hangry on the hangry thing. You know, and thank you for for opening up and sharing those things with us. I mean, you know, it's like it's so funny. People may not know how much of an impact you can have on someone else by just taking interest in noticing, you know, and saying. You know, you may notice it, but saying to that person, you have a talent here or, you know, yeah. I'm going to support you in your dreams. And those are the building blocks that make a successful person. So always yeah. share the good yes. stuff with especially Absolutely. young people. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, and I, I, you know, I want to ask you this one too, because you work with creatives all day long and you are a creative. Mm -hmm. What does creativity mean to you? So this is a tough question. I feel like I can, I can come at it from a couple of different angles. In, in the big kind of big picture sense, creativity is something that I need to be immersed in. Um, mm -hmm. I, am, I live in a, a loft, an artist loft uh, workspace building. There's a, a, an art gallery in our lobby. Um, I'm surrounded by very overt signs of creativity all the time. And I feed off that. So it, it's, it, it, I need film. I need art, I need books, I need music. If I'm not at a show listening to my favorite band or going to a museum on a regular basis, then there's, I actually start to deflate, I think. <laughs> so I would say creativity to me in one sense is lifeblood. And on a, in another sense, if I look at it more personally, 
I mean, I've been creative since I, I can remember. I was always drawing or writing or coming up with new ideas about things, but it, it, in the end, it's how I solve problems. And so there's a part of me that thinks that if we could all be a little bit more creative in how we address things, then uh, some of the issues that we face as a society and as a world today, we'd, we'd be able to circumvent them or come to solutions more quickly. I think we're always in these boxes, prescribed mm. boxes. And creativity, whether it comes in the form of you know, that amazing painting or that wonderful poem, or it's just as somebody saying, no, wait a second, why don't we try it this way? I, if there's, there's so many answers <laughs> and waiting <laughs> and being willing to open your mind to that energy, um, that flow. Um, I, I, yeah, it's a, it's such a great question because I don't know what I would do without it. Mm. And what a beautiful answer. You're so eloquent and, and you answered that so well. I wasn't sure how that question would, would, would land and you just, you answered it beautifully and, and you know, the, from the immersion place, but also from, you know, the filling of the well, so to speak, from mm. the creativity and surrounding yourself with it and, and, and using it, but then the impact it can have for, for other people, if we, we just use that part of us a little bit more and got out of the box. It's so, I mean, that you just 360 encompass that whole thing so well. And thank you for, for taking that question on. Yeah. So let's recap, speaking of creativity, Let's recap <laughs> for everyone the details of Buy a Horse Book Day on May 10th. Just make sure everybody got that. I'm going to include, the, include that in the show notes. And then we can talk a little bit about where people can find more information about you and Trafalgar Square Books. So May 10th, it's right around the corner, believe it or not, people. <laughs> <laughs> right after Mother's Day is May 10th. Don't forget Mother's Day either. Buy a Horse Book Day. Try to remember the hashtag. It's easy. Uh, go out find a place to buy a horse book. It doesn't matter where it is and it doesn't matter which horse book it is. We want people to be enthusiastic about reading, about learning about horses, about supporting those who write about horses and write stories and are brave enough because you have to be brave to share that with the world. So we're really encouraging as many people as possible to get involved and then post a picture. Um, it can be you with your book. It can be your kid with the book. It can be your horse with the book. Um, it could just be you. Um, making that purchase online, post a picture, tag it, and you could, you'll be up for winning prizes. We're going to repost things that people are posting. So we'll share it with our audience and Heels Down will share it with theirs. And I bet a bunch of our authors will be really nice and go around and like and tag and share so we can all, you know, feel like a big family. So that's the goal. Awesome. And don't forget on Trafalgar Square Books website, it's 20% off on Horse Book Day, right? With free shipping. Did I get that right? Correct. 20% off, free shipping, www.horseandriderbooks.com. And that's on by Horse Book Day, which is May 10th. Come by, visit, buy book, but you can also go buy them from other people too. Yes, let's let's buy multiple uh, horse books on Buy a Horse Book Day, and and uh, you know, independent author, all authors of horse books are welcome to participate in this. Yes. There's graphics floating around. Let's let's really supercharge this and get behind it, and and just watch this thing grow. Did you want to share uh, where people can find True Fogger Square Books on on social media as well? So on Instagram and Facebook, we're at Horse and Rider Books. And on Twitter, we're at TSB Books uh, online, horseandriderbooks.com. And there are ways to find my email. And please reach out if you have ideas, if you have questions, if you want graphics, so you can post them for Buy Horse Book Day. Don't be shy. I always really, really enjoy talking with you. You inspire me. You are so thoughtful. You're very generous. You're, you're wonderful with your authors. You're creative. You, you know, you're just a really, really great person. I appreciate you coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Carly. This was really fun. It's always great to talk to you. Thanks for joining us this week on the Equestrian Author Spotlight Podcast. I hope you enjoy these Q&A sessions with wonderful equine authors who love all things horses and writing, just like me. Visit my website, carlycadecreative.com, where you can read the show notes, and make sure you never miss a show by clicking the subscribe button now. This podcast is made possible by listeners like you. Thank you so much for your support. Want a free guide to secrets of horse book authors? Gallop over to carlycadecreative.com forward slash wisdom to have author advice delivered instantly to your inbox. If you are an author, who writes about horses and would like to be spotlighted, please let me know. Visit my contact page at carlycadecreative.com to fill out a request. I'd be happy to have you on the show too. Thank you for tuning in to the Equestrian Author Spotlight Podcast. 
See you next time. I'm your host, Carly Cade. Creative writing makes my spurs jingle.